Hi, I'm Angie Wickenden. I'm a potter teacher and experimental archaeologist based in Plymouth. This project started off after a request by the owner of Hembury Hill Fort, Carol Jevons, if I wouldn't mind being filmed digging out Gabbro clay and so a full experimental archaeology on early southwest British Neolithic Gabbro ceramics developed. The Hembury Bowl, on exhibition at the Royal Albert Memorial Museum, Exeter, Devon, was excavated by Dorothy Liddell in the 1930s when she was excavating the Iron Age hill fort. She found the banks and ditches of the earlier Neolithic causeway enclosure. Formal typologies classify this as the Hembury Bowl style by Piggott in 1954 and the Southwestern style by Whittle in 1977. It represents the introduction of ceramics to the British Isles due to its early radiocarbon dates from the Hembury Causeway enclosure of 3,690 Cal BC by Whittle et al. in 2011. The bowl is made out of gabbro clay as diagnosed by Kit Peacock in 1969-1988 and comes from the lizard Cornwall. It is also due to the 1960s identification of the clay that subsequent analyses of trade networks of prestigious objects in southwest Britain's Neolithic have been established. This clay fabric can be recognised by eye due to its distinctive inclusions of plagiar clays feldspars. Lucy Harrod in 2004 has pinpointed two sites which may have been used for clay extraction in the Bronze Age and the Iron Age. The early Neolithic in southwest Britain is characterised as a non-sedentary, semi-mobile society, agro-pastoralist horticultural society, which practised transhumance and seasonal aggregation practices at causeway enclosures. This has a direct relevance for our categories of the Chêne Operatoire. Today I'm presenting a general case study, an overview of the, the work I have done to date on Gabbro clay and Henbury bowls. There is still a lot more to do and the project is far from finished. I've reenacted a complete Chêne Operatoire, the reconstruction of a Henbury bowl, and I've conducted potter's tests on the material properties of the clay. I'll explain the location of the Gabbro outcrop and Hembury. I will discuss comparative evidence of ceramic production techniques from the Hembury assemblage and I will introduce the comparative technology approach I am taking to produce some interpretations on how the bowl was made by comparing two reconstructions and the bowl itself. I will also focus on the Hembury bowl potter, her decision making and thought processes. This is a close-up of the interior of the bowl sheds of the Hembury Bowl. The plagioclase clay feldspars are these white flecks which make this pottery fabric so distinctive and easy to diagnose. Note the even rim and the smooth surface. The Hembury Bowl itself is a reconstruction in plaster made during the 1970s. This shot is showing just how big a proportion of the original sheds make up the bowl and it's possible to see how thin the bowl was. These are two Hembury type bowl reconstructions. The photo on the left is of Robin with his Gabbro bowl and right is my reconstruction. Both pots have different methods of reconstruction and biographies. Robin made his bowl by pinching the base then coiling the walls and I made my bowl by using a concave mould and coiling the walls. These bowls along with the original will make up the comparative Chêne Operatoire. These sheds are from the Hembury assemblage and put into context how highly variable the Hembury assemblage pottery was. These pots were rapidly made bowls and baggy shaped pots. There are a large number of marks left on the interior and exterior of the pots. The rims are often uneven in many of these sheds. The shirt on the left shows the addition of a coil. On the right, the shirt shows the surface was smoothed in an attempt to conceal the inclusions. The Lizard Peninsula, Cornwall, UK, is where gabbro clay comes from. The problem or question remains for the British Neolithic. Was the pottery made on the lizard or was the clay or pottery transported across country? An extensive field walking project took place in the 1980s, 
searching for Neolithic wasters. No evidence was found for Neolithic pottery production. In fact, it is difficult to identify any production traces in the archaeological record for the British Neolithic. Cruise Gravels and Lowland Point are the sites that Harrods Provenance studies isolated and where we dug out the clay for our reconstructions. The Chan Operatoire when translated means technical sequence can be used to record and examine production making strategies of archaeological material and experimental reconstructions. It's based on Gosland's 2018 model. Gosselin sets out this template for the breakdown of mandatory processes in the ceramics chaîne opératoire. Each category in purple is mandatory and due to these it's possible to make high validity inferences where the categories apply both to the past and the present. What matters is that comparisons be always made at the same analytical level. Critics argue that chaîne opératoire are often focused on how and what questions and have been less adept at addressing who and why questions. This study will draw out relevant thought and behaviour sequences of the potter from the material processes that are common to all ceramic production methods along with technical choices, decision making and thought processes. This model places the potter at the heart of the action that it's not and it's now possible to write and visualise a fairly accurate reconstruction of the potter in her landscape making the bowl. There would have been no established tradition when the clay was first used in the British Neolithic, so the question remains how did the potters know about this clay in 3700 BC? The use of gabbro clay lasted for 5000 years. This point in the Chen Opera is an opportunity to examine technological change in the British Mesolithic Neolithic transition. It's a universal expectation of potters that clays have the characteristic of workability or plasticity. A lack of plasticity can be caused by a large number of regular large inclusions where too much coarse material causes the clay to rupture. This was an initial characteristic of the Gabbro clay samples we dug out at all three sites, but as subsequent use, practice and tests have shown, it's strong enough, even when first dug out, to retain its shape under its own weight while pinching a thick-walled small vessel. It passed also the normal field plasticity test of making a coil, forming a knot without many ruptures. So gabbro clay is difficult to work initially and requires a certain level of skill even once it is plasticized, but even in its least plastic state, it is still a formable medium. As ceramic raw materials are highly variable and usually unusable in this raw state, the potter in some manner increases the plasticity or workability of the clay either through a wet or dry process. We chose the dry process for our gabbro samples and this is subdivided into three further stages. Drying the clay, two crushing and removal of non-plastics and three adding of or not of temper and water and then homogenisation. In the case of gabbro clay, complete homogenisation and plasticising can be achieved by souring or weathering or puddling or storing the clay in a wet state over a long period. Any attempt to make pottery with the unplasticised clay produced thick, inarticulate forms. The first attempts at using the clay were difficult and it became worthless to expend time to try and create a Hembry-type bowl at this stage. Robin said he became so frustrated when he first used the clay in 2016 that he threw it in a corner, retrieved it again after 18 months and made his fantastically thin, small version of Hembry-type bowl. As part of the contemporary chaîne of Patois and general good practice, the contemporary potter undertakes various tests on a new wild clay. Unfortunately, there's not enough room here for the full reproduction of these results, but in short, shrinkage tests and maturing temperatures were recorded. My student Mallory, Robin and myself initially found the clay on plastic difficult to work. It takes four to five months of storing the clay in a wet state to plasticise it adequately to be able to make a thin-walled vessel. Gosselin lists three essential social relations with the ceramic chaîne opératoire when knowledge is acquired, relationships between 
which develop between potter communities such as knowledge transmission and ruin 2011 that says socially defined groups can be rendered archaeologically visible by their associations with their technical profiles. Direct and sustained face-to-face interactions. Mallory and Robin learnt directly from me. Casual interactions which develop in shared practice settings will learn by copying Robin and asking him questions. And three, mediated interactions where potters learn by copying styles other than their own. Robin and myself learnt how to make the Henry Bolt by copying it. It's important to record detail in the Chenopratoire categories. I've designed this template to record the technical gestures of our Henry Bowl Potter. I chose the concave mould and coil addition technique. There is archaeological evidence for this technical choice being used in the Neolithic. Cola Satel 2014 illustrated how French LBK Neolithic potters in 5300 BC made their round bottom pots by analysing production sequences and technical gestures in the Valley de Lenne. She has developed a spatial and temporal history of the development of production techniques. She describes and illustrates how these potters make their round bottom pots in concave and convex moulds using diagnostic features in the original sheds as evidence. Making a round bottom pot in a concave mould is by far the easiest and most time efficient method and is my preferred production method to teach. It does not require an extended apprenticeship to learn, as does the paddle and anvil technique. Pots can be air dried or dried by a fire. For all clay types, drying by the fire speeds up the process. I also dry pots in the sun in warmer seasons and on top of the kiln. During drying and before firing, the pottery is fragile and vulnerable to breakage. This drying category is also relevant to a pot that will take an extended time to make. During hand building, clay will begin to dry out as soon as it is exposed to the air. The base of the pot has to dry to an optimum, medium soft, leather hard consistency to be strong enough to support the addition of new clay. The practice of this skill is evidence for water management by the Henry Bowl Potter. As the pot wall is so thin, either she had to work quickly or she was maintaining the hydration of the top coil by wetting it further, or even covering the bowl with a wet cloth or hide. The placing and joining of the trumpet lugs are also evidence for this stage of leather hardness. If the potter had attempted to place the lugs on soft clay, she would have distorted the bowl. And there is no evidence of this. The even rim is also evidence for some kind of rotational practice. Either she walked round the pot, smoothing the rim, with a wet hide or rotated the pot somehow using a piece of hide to smooth the rim. It took a week, even given optimum drying conditions, for this reconstruction to dry out completely. Firing pottery in open fires and outdoor built kilns is a skill which needs to be learnt. As stated above, there is no evidence of how Neolithic potters fired their pots, although Gibson in 2002 inter- interpretation is that pits were used for firing. I do my firings at Beacon Cross Cops in Devon, run by Alan Bruford as a forest school. Wood fuel is gathered from cropping trees. During previous experiments, grades of wood were used on the diam- on the basis of the diameter of the branch for the successive stages of firing into tinder, kindling, small wood, medium and large wood. This is the film High on Henbury Hill Part 2, made by Chris Chapman on the making of Gabbro Bowls can be found on the next slide at www.henbryfort.co.uk which has been compiled by Carol Jevons to promote the conservation, archaeology and ecology of the site. Thank you for listening and here is a short video of a kiln we built at Beacon Cross Cops and I would like to extend an invitation to our pottery firing weekends. The next one now will be summer 2022. Many thanks for watching.